Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. A gentleman sat with us this morning. He was a 12-year-old who watched the planes go by and bomb Pearl Harbor. And as he grew up as a native Hawaiian, he told story after story about how Hawaii recovered, how America recovered. I was so moved by what happened right here where we're standing. The standard was set here 69 years ago. And we hope when we're done, that you will be as proud of us from Walsh Construction and our collaborators at HOK as we are of those people 69 years ago. Thank you. We're currently on Pier Foxtrot 5, attached to Fort Island here in Pearl Harbor. When Pearl Harbor was first discovered, it was a natural uh, shelter in the Pacific. Um, and that's the original reason why the Navy decided to have a footprint here. Originally, it was a coaling station. Right behind us is a memorial that was built over the hull of the USS Arizona, which was attacked and sunk on December 7, 1941, and currently is the resting place for 1,177 sailors and Marines. So most folks start at the Arizona worked their way over to the battleship Missouri, which is where the signing of the uh, surrender documents from the uh, Imperial Navy occurred back in 1945. And then on the southern end of Fort Island, we had the Pacific Aviation Museum, which is a tribute to aviation from World War II all the way up to the present day. This is a very active base. In fact, we have Air Force missions occurring on the airfield. And then as you come over to the Navy side, we've got a shipyard where we do repairs to both surface combatants as well as nuclear powered submarines. We've got a, uh, a special warfare compound here and as well as a national security agency facility. NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We have two primary missions. One is environmental prediction. So we forecast the weather, including severe thunderstorms, winter storms, um, tornadoes, hurricanes, you name it, and then environmental stewardship, so we're stewards of the ocean. We're uniquely the agency that's been by design set up to study and understand and fuse together knowledge of the ocean and the atmosphere and the natural systems of the planet, not just for understanding, but so that we can turn that into something I call environmental intelligence. The kind of information you and I need every day to plan things as simple as taking an umbrella or not, sometimes more significant things like evacuating a community from the face of a tsunami threat. NOAA currently has 12 different offices around the island of Oahu. With the in a way, Regional Central will be consolidating into one place. The history of what was here before the IRC was constructed is very unique. What was parked alongside this side of the island were all of the famous aircraft carriers that won the battle midway. Where the NOAA facility is was two of the most significant hangars that the Navy had because that's where all the carrier planes were serviced. This was the birthplace of that aviation in the Pacific. I mean, it happened right here. And so when you look at those runways, you think of all of the pilots of World War II that were Navy pilots or Marine pilots, they were there. When we got here and when Walsh pulled in to begin their project, the buildings were literally in ruin. There was water coming in the ceilings and they were close to collapsing in a couple of places.
There are several challenges getting involved when you build a project of this magnitude. Uh, it starts everywhere from material procurement. Then you're also worried about the shipping of that product from the mainland area of the United States to the island. Getting here onto Ford Island, we also have a bridge we have to cross that is a movable bridge, so there's a lot of weight restrictions that come into the logistics, getting all this material here. You're also on a very secure naval installation. All the material coming on is subject to search, so we have a lot of security requirements of the Navy in terms of their protecting the troops and us being able to work inside their uh, security perimeter here on Ford Island. Every individual worker, not only did they have to go through a background check just for a pass or a badge, but then they had to go through a screen in order to have the clearance to come across Fort Island Bridge to access the job site. The subcontractors that were involved with building this project did their best in order to obtain workforce from the local labor unions here on the island, which has been very impressive. On a running tally, we're probably anywhere from 60 to 75 percent using local labor forces. The NAVFAC and Navy requirements are very high standards, so we have to not only meet the OSHA standards, but the EM385 standards, which are uh, pretty strict. But so far, we've done a good job with that, and we have had no lost time, injuries, or accidents to date. The design idea was quite simple. We took the two hangars that sat side by side, and there was almost an equidistant amount of space between them. And then we filled that space in with a very simple steel and glass pavilion. And then we treated this giant building as a kind of enormous shed. And under this shed roof, we created a campus that lies underneath this. And as you move into the spaces in hangars 176 and 175, you'll see these various courtyards. And so we cut space down deep into the building to allow natural light and the ventilation ideas to work systemically throughout the project. The two hangar buildings, the structural steel inside, obviously since 1941, have corroded extensively. So we had to go in and do a survey of all of the existing structural steel in the building. The hangars themselves really only had one main floor by virtue of that structural steel that we put in and by reusing the steel that we already had, we were able to put in a second floor level in both of the hangar buildings. The hangars were used for large aircraft storage and repair, so they have giant aircraft hangar doors that are on each of the ends of the buildings. The hangar doors that are on this project were lead coated uh, and a lot of the glass was broken and damaged over the years. So we had to come in with a special team that could make the door safe to remove the lead paint, and then we had to remove panes of glass that were broken. Glass was salvaged and repurposed from other locations to restore the hangar doors to their previous glory. That sounds pretty simple in concept and idea, but in reality that took almost two months from start to finish to complete that process. We also refurbished some uh, airfield lights on the south side of the building. They uh, illuminated all the aircraft that were tethered down on the historic tarmac. Obviously these fixtures no longer worked, but we had to take those fixtures down, take those out and have molds made of them, and then create new ones out of a polycarbonate material that we could put up to simulate what the original fixtures looked like. As you walk by what is now a modern office building, you can appreciate what was here before then. They were a repair facility that fixed these fighter aircraft, so you can make that connection with history. As stewards of the environment, sustainable design is, um, is something we wanted to set an example with. Well, you know, that's one of our fortes in building and construction is that as the Walsh Group, we do a lot of lead buildings throughout the industry. And we're proud to be able to say that, you know, right in our own backyard, we built our new headquarters building as a lead building and actually achieved lead platinum. By virtue of lead platinum, that pretty much means you've salvaged everything that you could possibly do in order to build that project. As far as the lead certification on this building, there are probably three most critical elements that are involved. In order to save energy, we are using what's referred to as passive cooling units. In essence, it's a chimney effect. What happens is the air will be captured on top of the roof of the building and then it'll be chilled by these coils. We've got this cold coil and warm air 
and the warm air is just attracted to the cold coil. The cold air falls down through the shafts into the building, into the raised floor, and then raises through openings in the building, and then migrates up through the building, pulling more air with it, and then escapes by gravity out through the top of the building. And that allows for a building that's a federal headquarters for NOAA to be a facility that essentially operates without mechanical fans. Another sustainable strategy is the, the water use. We're collecting condensate water from the cooling system as well as collecting all the rainwater off of the roofs. And we're filtering that water, processing it, and bringing it back into the building and using it for flushing of toilets and some gray water uses. And then we're also using water outside in the landscaping so that we're not using any potable water, which is gonna be a more and more precious resource. And then third, and most importantly as well, is the light harvesting system that we have. There are 124 skylights on this project, so there is a tremendous amount of natural light. We created a system of apertures that sort of grace the entire shed roof. It's very smartly censored and controlled so that no matter where you are in the building, you have the same aspect of light on any work surface. This building really is ahead of its time and on its way to meeting the goals and the needs of the future and really driving down energy use. We'll cut our carbon footprint between 40 and 50 percent and we can use some of those savings to improve our programs and enhance some of our research. This is an evolutionary step forward. We have the infrastructure to support our mission as well as some of our partners. It's an efficiency, obviously. We'll have our warehouse with our ships, our ships with our labs, our labs with our offices and staff. The other big benefit is collaboration. So weather forecasters, tsunami forecasters, and climate scientists are all in the same building and so they can collaborate more and do a better job performing their mission. The central atrium to the main facility, it's set up for education and outreach. So our goal is to have students either in middle school or high school come here as a school group and learn about the environment, learn about the oceans, learn about NOAA. The building allows us to do that. Ultimately, the goal is to improve services to the public, and by being here, we can do that. It was incumbent upon us, those of us on the design side, the contractor, NOAA, and NAFAC, to find a way to partner to create something that was really larger than the sum of the pieces. Having partners like Walsh is at the heart of why something like this can be built. Part of the Walsh mission statement, besides delivering a quality, safe product, is also citizenship. The Utah Memorial is adjacent to the new NOAA facility. It had a temporary uh, ramp system for the handicap made out of aluminum and metal and two by fours. An Eagle Scout was looking how to achieve his badge. So one of the things that the Scout group looked at in conjunction with the Walsh team was, okay, there's a way we can improve that ramp system in order to make it better. We were able to engage with this Eagle Scout, working with him, providing a little restoration to the Utah Memorial. And we talk about honor in the past, you know, they just renamed it the Senator Daniel K. in a way, Pacific Regional Center. That's really touching because it honors a man who fought during World War II, he fought to fight in the war. Despite the fact that he was born here, and um, unfortunately because of his Japanese ancestry declared an enemy alien, um, he wanted to prove his loyalty like the men of the 442nd that he served with. So for him, the military in Hawaii was important. Pearl Harbor, Fort Island uh, had a very special meaning for him. He had the opportunity to represent the state, the people of Hawaii, which he treasured every day. He loved his job. He helped identify the land here on Ford Island, and he also was instrumental in getting the funding for NOAA to construct this site. He knew that the environment was growing in its criticality, and that NOAA was poised to be at the forefront of that. So for us, it was very important to be able to 
succeed on his behalf to build this facility, which will now be able to support 700 people working in the community in order to make our world a better place to live. year ago tomorrow that the Senator passed on uh, and it's hard to think of a more fitting way among all the many honors and tributes that have flowed very so rightfully to him over the past year to be here today in one of his favorite places with this creatively designed facility that brings so many things he was passionate about together and have today be the day we bring it to life is sort of a perfect bookend a perfect celebration for the eve of an anniversary of the passing. He felt it was important to anchor the past, but always be looking to the future. And NOAA represents that future.